Good morning and welcome to CSIS. My name is Morgan Hickman and I'm a fellow in the Energy Security and Climate Change Program. Yesterday, the Army released the implementation plan for its climate strategy. Today, we are excited to host the launch event for that plan. Uh, that plan sort of targets two high-level goals. Uh, one is a 50% emissions reduction by 2030 from a 2005 baseline. Another is a net zero emissions target by 2050. The implementation plan talks about near-term objectives, tasks, metrics, and resources to support those long-term goals. I'm joined today by two esteemed guests. Paul Farnan is the, I have to cheat here, sorry, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Army Installations, Energy, and Environment. And Sharon Burke is a former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy Plans and Programming. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I would like to start with sort of a high level view of the Army climate strategy and the implementation plan, the goals that are set forth and how these two uh, different uh, resources work together to support the Army's goals. Paul, could you tell us about that? Um, sure, I wanna start with why we did this. Um, we started with the climate strategy a year ago, really because climate is not some futuristic threat uh, that's kind of out there in the universe somewhere. Climate change is actually affecting the Army today, right now. Uh, whether it's uh, the storms in the southeast, uh, stronger, more frequent hurricanes that are just continuing to batter our installations and threaten our soldiers and our families, uh, the polar ice caps melting, uh, there's now a call for a permanent force up in Alaska, so we're expanding our presence in Alaska, uh, or the wildfires out west. Uh, thousands of National Guardsmen now spend their summers fighting wildland fighters, uh, fires, so we are dealing with the effects of climate change right now. Um, but I also just want to stop and also say, while well, the climate strategy is very much about uh, reducing our emissions and dealing with the challenges of climate change, everything within the climate strategy will actually enhance the capabilities of the Army. Uh, it will increase the resilience and modernization of our installations, uh, which is very important because uh, in these days, we're actually in a contested homeland. Um, in, you know, in our history, uh, the wars always started on the European battlefield or in the Far East, uh, far from our shores. So we simply just, you know, we had our troops, we sent them to the ships, we sent them overseas, and that's where the, the war started, uh, but not anymore. Uh, we've never fought a war in a contested homeland, uh, but we believe we will never again fight a war that's not in a contested homeland. Uh, the battle starts here. There's going to be something that is going to um, impede our ability to get our forces to the battlefield, be it a natural disaster or a cyber attack on, that takes the grid down. Uh, our installations still have to be able to operate. Um, so everything in the climate strategy, while it is in fact uh, addressing greenhouse gas emissions, it is also making our installations more resilient, more capable of actually projecting our forces in a time of need. Uh, it also increases the capabilities of the actual uh, warfighting force. Uh, by reducing the fuel that we need on the battlefield, we're increasing the range of our vehicles, uh, we're reducing the amount of forces we need for, uh, to protect our contested logistics lines, uh, and we're protecting the safety of our soldiers. Very good. And so talk to us a little bit about um, the di sub sort of substantive differences between the climate strategy and this implementation plan. So really, the strategy and the implementation plan, they're just two chapters of the same book, if you will. Uh, the strategy sets out the what, the, the big picture, what do we want to accomplish. The implementation plan is the how. How are we actually going to do it? So while the objective set out in the strategy, the implementation plan just gives us timelines, uh, when we're going to accomplish it. Um, it actually uh, assigns responsibility. Who is responsible to oversee specific objectives to make sure it gets done? Um, and what I will also say is the implementation plan is a short-term thing. Uh, many of the objectives in the strategy reach out into the 2030s and 40s and some even all the way out to 2050 uh, because of the long-term goals that we have to accomplish. But what we do know is you know, a lot of the long-term goals, we don't know how we're going to accomplish them yet. Uh, the technology is going to continue to evolve. Um, so what we did with the implementation plan, we purposely set it out uh, from now until 2027. Uh, knowing that in 2027, technology, we're going to be in a totally different world. There's going to be capabilities there that we can't even uh, imagine right now, and that's going to help us accomplish that. So what we're doing with this implementation plan is, one, we're setting the foundation for the long-term goals. What do we need to do now to make sure that the Army uh, and DOD is moving in the right direction to accomplish these long-term goals? Uh, but at the same time, it's also actually moving us toward those goals. Uh, so we're, there's some very real accomplishments that are going to be set forward uh, over the next five years. Very good. I should note for our virtual audience that the implementation plan has been linked on the CSIS webpage. 
Um, Sharon, the beginning of this implementation plan talks a lot about how the Army climate strategy builds on sort of climate and energy related initiatives that have already been undergone and, and sort of in the, in the works already. And I wondered if you could give us sort of a, a longer view of the extent to which you think this is sort of a natural continuation of work that's been done or a more transformative sort of piece of action? It's a, it's a great implementation plan. Well, first of all, that is already discontinuous because you know, this, this town, you could you know, build a fortress out of all of the reports that have made statements but have never actually been implemented. So having an implementation plan, and by the way, I think it's Annex B was my favorite part, because that actually slots the money, I think, against yeah. the, the, so that alone is discontinuous, so I just wanna call that out right away. But, but as for the history, it's a really interesting question because it, you know, there's also some really interesting continuity here in that when we talk about war and environmental quality, they, they don't always go together, right? War is not about the environment, it's a consumptive and destructive activity. It consumes natural resources and it destroys natural resources. And that's been true as long as human beings have been throwing rocks at each other. So, so when you talk about, well, what does it mean for a military to be considering the environment? It's an interesting question. And I would say a really interesting point in history here is, is starting around 1992 with the end of the Cold War. And you have the Department of Defense having to reckon with a really difficult legacy, environmental legacy. And there are still, I looked it up this morning, there are still something like 600 military Superfund sites out there. And a lot of them are Cold War legacy sites. So you know, we learned the hard way, and you know, we had a Sherry Goodman as a Clinton era official in there figuring out that not just how do you clean up the aftermath of a war, but how do you fight in a way that's not so destructive to your own country or you know, to countries that are someday going to become your partners and your allies. And so that started at that point. And, and some of what we're seeing now is a, a legacy of that. But this is also different in that what Paul Farnan here is talking about, what the Army is talking about, is not just how you fight war um, and also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> not just how you fight war and the large enterprise you have that fights a war, but also the conditions around you that set the battle space and that determine what kind of war you fight. And it's all of that. So it's what legacy do you leave, but it's also, it's certainly in, in the United States, our military, our Department of Defense is a you know, trillion dollar, two million person enterprise that's in every state in the country and around the world, how they choose to build that ca uh, capability is going to have implications. Um, but then also the big change here is that climate change is not just, okay, something nice to do or something that we have to incorporate into that large uh, enterprise that we have. It's also something that's shaping the strategic environment, the threat environment, how we operate, where we operate. And this strategy is taking all of that into account and saying, what does it mean for the Army? And then the most interesting part of this history is that during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, energy on the battlefield became a liability because it was putting um, more risk in for our forces, both in terms of they needed to have continuity of operations but they also needed to protect these large fuel convoys because we are a very fuel intensive military. And Congress was very active on that and asked the department to change that footprint, um, both to make a more effective military to minimize the risk to fielded forces and to lower the costs at the time. That was not the number one reason, it never is on a battlefield, but it was part of it. And so there was some thinking there too about the battlefield is changing. So some of this is sort of a natural evolution to the point we're at now, um, where energy on the battlefield is also changing as far as the contested logistics that Paul mentioned and all of that. So those efforts to innovate our way out of that, both in the way we fight and in the technology we use to fight is part of the legacy we have here as well. So, and that was Obama era continued under the, Bush admin, or under the um, Trump administration, although at a lower ebb, um, those, those uh, technologies and innovations didn't get as much funding. 
but they did continue. Mm -hmm. So there was plenty of statutory and um, program level activity to build on, but this is a big expansion of all of that. Very good. I, I just want to oh, yeah, go ahead. off that. So I'm going to jump ahead yeah. a little bit and throw sure. our, our program a little out of whack, but I like to do that. Um, just the segue that uh, Sharon provided uh, with the operational energy side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you know, we've got three LOEs, and uh, LOE2 is the operational energy side. LOEs are lines of effort. I, I apologize. That's uh, okay. Depending on acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> or objectives <laughs> or however. Um, yeah. But anyway, you know, the, our first line of effort was in the insulations. That's where the Army burns most of our fuel, and that's where a lot of our greenhouse gas are going to come from. Uh, the second um, objective is uh, the operational energy side, uh, and that is, uh, for the Army, we're not the big fuel burners in the Pentagon. Uh, that's the Air Force and the Navy, the big planes, the big ships. That's where a lot of the gas is going to get burned. Um, we can still make a difference, and we will, uh, but really what this one is about is about, and so while it's not as important for strict emissions, it's most important for the soldiers. And so, I, so it's most important to us because this has a direct impact on the soldiers, on their ability on the battlefield, and on their safety. Um, you know, Sharon talked about the fuel lines in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, all of those fuel lines needed to be guarded by combat forces. We took casualties and we pulled combat forces away from the fight guarding logistics lines. If we can reduce the amount of fuel our vehicles use by 30, 40, 50 percent, you know, that's half of the fuel convoys we now have to protect. So that's half the casualties we're going to risk. Uh, that's half the amount of combat forces we're pulling away from the fight. And whether or not it's uh, trucks going through uh, austere terrain or whether it's ships trying to cross the Pacific, uh, those are long fuel lines that all have to be guarded. So by doing what we're doing, by decreasing the fuel, by hybridizing our tactical vehicles um, and cutting their fuel use, we're actually increasing the capabilities of our soldiers and providing them better protection. Very good. I appreciate all that context and background. Um, I want to get into the substance of this plan. So as you said, there are three lines of effort or LOEs, both in the climate strategy and in the implementation plan. And I will echo your sentiment, Sharon, that it is really uh, just refreshing to see a plan that so clearly lays out uh, concrete tasks, metrics to measure the tasks, assigns responsibility for them, uh, details the allocated resources to support them, um, and I, so I appreciate all of that. And, and so in this plan, we see sort of line items for each of these three LOEs. Um, and I would like to go through them one by one. The first is the installations. And you talked about um, that operational energy. Um, the installations part of the implementation plan talks a lot about microgrids and also about reducing the carbon emissions associated with power consumption. I, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about um, those uh, objectives and, and maybe uh, to the extent that you can, are there particular installations that have been prioritized for these kind of investments, or, or what can we expect in the next couple of years? Uh, sure. First, I have to say, as I'm sitting here taking all the accolades for this uh, strategy, I've got to thank the entire staff. We have a huge staff behind us that did a lot of work over the course of last year and really reached out. It's a, this is a, a broad Army uh, strategy. Uh, we touched every aspect of the Army across, around the world. So it's a lot of people that went into this, uh, and mostly Secretary Warmoth, Secretary of the, of the Army. Uh, it was her guidance and backing that allowed this to happen. Um, and every point that you just made about the, uh, you know, the timelines, the dates, uh, specific goals, that, that was all her. Uh, you know, she said to me on day one, I don't want just some pie in the sky strategy. I want to know what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, and how we're going to do it. So um, that allowed us to actually proceed. Uh, as far as the installations themselves, um, yeah, so what we're trying to do is build uh, modern, um, resilient installations. Um, any energy source that comes from outside of our fence lines is vulnerable. Uh, so whether that's, you know, a natural gas uh, generator on the installation, that's, there still has to be a pipeline coming from off base. That pipeline can be, is vulnerable to physical attack. Uh, and also, if the grid goes down, um, the gas is moved through pipelines through electric motors. So the gas is not going to be moving if the grid goes down. Uh, so that's vulnerable. Diesel generators, which the military traditionally always uses as a backup source of power. Um, you know, we're, that's great for the seven days that we have the diesel fuel on the base, but then what happens on day eight? Anyone that's lived through a hurricane and the after effects, you know that there's a week where you can't get any fuel because there's no electricity to make the pumps operate. So again, even the diesel generators, it's not a reliable source of backup power for the long term, and we have to plan for a long-term power outage in you know, weeks or maybe even months. Uh, so really what we need is we need self-contained generation. 
It just so happens that the best self-contained generation is also carbon-free generation. Uh, so what we're doing is we have a goal. Every one of our installations will have a microgrid um, installed by 2035, and that will allow the connection of on-site generation. It will allow us to also island the base and island our mission-critical systems so that we can focus, so we can still operate if the grid does go down. Uh, we're really focused on the generation aspect. Uh, we're putting so a lot of solar uh, everywhere. We're looking at geothermal. We're looking at all options across the board. Um, and it's not just, you know, we mentioned the funding, uh, and the funding obviously is important, but we're not just using appropriated tax dollars. Uh, we're actually finding partnerships for third-party financiers. We're working with utilities and private companies. A lot of the generation is actually not, we don't own it, and we don't operate it. We work with a partner. Uh, we've got a lot of land, obviously. We'll lease land to a local utility. They'll put up a, a solar array. They will own and operate that. Day-to-day -day operations, that energy, that carbon-free energy, it feeds the grid. So the local community is getting carbon-free electricity uh, that the Army is very much supporting. But we have an agreement with uh, the utility that in a contingency, in a national emergency, if the grid does go down, we have first right of refusal of that power. So that with the microgrids that we're installing, hooked up to the, uh, to the solar energy, uh, we're able to route that to our mission-critical system so that if the grid goes down and we have to deploy our forces, we're still able to do that. Uh, we're working to put battery storage, to pair battery storage with that to increase our resilience. Um, and again, this is a long-term effort. We're moving forward now, and we're doing really well with it. Uh, we're getting a lot of solar out there. I think within the next year, we've got 50 megawatts of solar under contract. Um, and I also want to emphasize is we're just beginning. Um, you know, the administration has set the goals uh, in their executive order. Uh, Secretary Warmoth has laid out the vision. Uh, we're now carrying it out. Um, but these things take time. Uh, we're going to ramp up. Uh, you'll see increasing funding going toward it. You'll see increasing effort. Um, and again, it'll be a curve. We're just, you know, we're starting to move up the, the vertical of the curve. Uh, it will take a little bit of time, but I'm optimistic that we're going we're gonna to make some great advances. As far as prioritizing bases, uh, yes and no. Uh, we're looking for opportunities everywhere. Um, all of our installations need to be resilient, need to be modernized. Um, but there are some bases that, in a contingency, in a war fighting scenario, are more important because that's where our forces are. So we have what we call power projection platforms, which are a handful of bases that um, are the, the prime installations where our combat forces will come from. Uh, so we're looking at them to make sure that those are resilient as quickly as possible. Uh, so we are, to an extent, uh, prioritizing those. But that's not to say it's not at the cost of the other installations. We're looking Army-wide to move everything forward. Very good. I have to ask, within this implementation plan, um, the, the programmed sort of resources uh, are allocated across these different objectives, and um, the installation's LOE, or line of effort, has certainly the most resources allocated to it, but there's also a noticeable shortfall, uh, particularly with respect to those microgrids. So I wonder, are these partnerships um, going to sort of help bridge that anticipated gap? So it's a combination. One, yes, there are going to be partnerships. Uh, there is money from within DOD that's not Army money. Uh, there are programs in uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense that we're tapping into uh, that is to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars that we'll be able to tap into, along with the other services, uh, to do these kind of things. Um, like I said, the outside groups, you know, private industry and utilities we're working with. Um, but when you're looking at just the budget numbers, I think it's important to realize, and this goes back to what I said a moment ago, is that we're just at the beginning. Uh, you know, this is only 2022. We're not even two years into the Obama, I'm sorry, into the Biden administration. Um, the 23 budget is really President uh, Biden's first full budget. Sure. You know, the 22 budget was, you know, they came in uh, at the beginning of 2021. They put the, they scrapped together, you know, the budget, what they could from the prior administration and put as much of their imprint on as possible. But this is really the first one. Um, and if you just look at the numbers, just, you know, in 2022, uh, there was allocated, I think, about $180 million for climate investments. In the President's 23 budget, that's already up to $450 million. Uh, and we anticipate uh, that that's just going to continue to increase. The President has set this as a priority uh, for a national, both as a national security threat and as an important thing to do uh, for the United States as a leader in, in the world. So you, I think you're going to see it continuing to increase. So I wouldn't read too much into where the numbers are yet. Okay. Uh, Sharon, I see you scribbling notes when you think about this uh, move toward renewables uh, for Army installations. Do you have any reflections on opportunities and challenges that Paul might not have touched upon yet? Well, of course, Paul touched on everything that, that, that's important. But, you know, one thing that's really worth considering is, is there was historically, since we were talking about history, 
a distinction between the energy you use for military operations and the energy you use in your installations, right? And, and that installations were somehow overhead or part of your real property. But that line is increasingly blurry, blurry. And a lot of our installations are extremely operational, you know, either because they're a place where forces are gonna deploy from, but also we have a lot of installations that are, conduct, that are supporting unmanned systems and intelligence operations from the United States. So they're very much an active part of the, of the battle. And you know, just in recent weeks, we've gotten a good look at, at what's, what the issue is here. I mean, it, when Ian was first tracking for Florida, it was like on the nose for MacDill Air Force Base. Not the Army's problem, but, but in a way it is because of, of course, what's at MacDill Air Force Base, Special Operations Command and Central Command. So you know, two big combatant command headquarters that are very actively deployed right now where it was headed right for them. And you know, how resilient is that base? Not resilient enough for that. So these are very present questions for all of the military forces. And, that, and again, the distinction between what's sort of home and you can afford to take some risk and, and what's very much in the fight and you can't. So you know, the question of renewable energy, <coughs> um, as, as Paul said, you know, the, one of the distinctions here is what's gonna make you more resilient and renewable energy is something that you can generate locally and still remain tied to the grid and get the benefits of the scale too. And the microgrid and the storage sort of navigate those two possibilities. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. And I think when the military or when the army is defining what's in their own best interest to allow them to operate, that's when they really get to pull in their own innovative power. So putting microgrids and storage on the docket as something that's going to make the military operate better will be, could be transformative for those technologies. Where there's a lot of commercial interest, but you know, and there's a lot of money out there looking for a place to invest. So in other words, the Army's step here to do something that makes them a better Army has the potential to become a big benefit for the broader energy innovation economy. Very good. I want to pivot to LOE2, which is acquisition and logistics in the Army climate strategy. And uh, I think of particular interest to this audience might be um, ideas about electrification of tactical vehicles. Paul, do you want to talk, tell us about some of the objectives in that area? Sure. Uh, and like I said, this isn't the big fuel burn emissions one for us, but this is the direct impact on the soldiers. Um, so what we're looking at is how do we reduce the fuel need on the battlefield? Um, the long-term goal uh, is complete electrification of our tactical vehicles, um, but that is a long-term goal. Our goal is 2050, uh, and quite simply, and I, people ask me this all the time, how are you going to do this? The honest answer is I don't know, uh, and that's why the goal is out to 2050, because we don't know how we're going to get there yet. Uh, the, the technology is not there to give us full electrification of tactical vehicles. I don't know how we're going to do battlefield charging yet. Nobody knows that. But that's part of the uh, near-term objectives in this implementation plan, right, is to think about that. A absolutely. And again, that's where the implementation plan, even though it's five years, it's setting the foundation for these longer-term goals. Uh, and this is going to be an iterative process. Uh, we're already starting, uh, we're getting ready to install anti-idle kits uh, on our tactical vehicles. And that will allow, it's not full hybridization, but it will allow, so, a lot of our combat vehicles, when they're out on the battlefield, they're not always moving. They'll actually spend hours just sitting in place. Um, but because everything's electrified now, communications, radars, night vision goggles, you name it, uh, that vehicle need, and the soldiers within it, they need power to operate. Um, so you have to run the engine. The anti-idle kit uh, is a big battery. It's close to being a hybrid. It basically it lets you shut down the engine uh, and still power everything. Uh, and by shutting down the engine, you're reducing your acoustic signature and your thermal signature, two things that weapons can hone in on. So just by doing this, we're not only we're reducing the amount of fuel these vehicles need and reducing the amount of fuel we have to move to the battlefield, we are providing better protection for our soldiers. Uh, the next step is going to be the full hybridization. And we're working with industry on getting our vehicles fully hybridized um, so that, again, it's a significant fuel reduction um, and it's an iterative process. So by the end of the decade, We'll be turning. Uh, we'll be actually producing um, hybridized vehicles. At the same time, uh, we're setting goals. We're, we're setting, you know, working out policies and strategies to how are we going to get to the battlefield charging to the full electrification of our tactical vehicles. We're working with our acquisition team. We're working with Army Futures Command 
um, to start figuring out now how we're going to get there and setting the intermediate goals so that we're not going to wait till 2035 to start thinking about the problem. We're thinking about it now and starting to work through the solutions. Very good. And can I, two things that are really interesting about this. One is that the Army has been interested in hybridization forever. They've been looking at doing this for vehicles for, what, 20 or 30 years because it gives you a performance gain. Um, so, and then also Army, Army uh, Futures Command was looking at, you know, with some concepts with electrification of the battlefield, you know, 10 years ago. So, so there's, there's, some, there's always been interest there, and, and now the times have changed, and, it, and it's a much more robust interest. So this strategy is really building on some interest in the Army that's longstanding. So, you know, the, the one other thing about the acquisition process is that this is a specific piece of equipment where you're trying to figure out its role on the battlefield. And we did do a study back in 2013 that showed that some of the Army's heavy vehicles, the fuel demand for some of the newer generation of planned vehicles, were actually going to be a liability on the battlefield. So this is really a, a, a direction that's about how do you operate better. But acquisition is also an interesting, there's two different opportunities here. There's this is a really important platform for the Army. How do you make it better? But then there's also the question of how do you just make everything better? So how do you build a better platform, but also how do you change the way you acquire things so that you know, it's not so much we're going to spend that money, but it's more we're going to spend all of our money better. So that's part, I think, of the acquisition reform. Yeah. And we're working closely with the acquisition team and changing the performance parameters that we, are, that we look at. And we've got a lot of support from the Deputy Secretary of Defense to make that happen across the services. So again, from day one, as we start thinking about new platforms, uh, the, the use of energy is being much more incorporated into the thinking. So and that just makes you a better military at the end of the day. Absolutely. And, and before we leave LOE2, I... No, I don't want to leave LOE2 okay, yet. We're talking, oh, okay. about Go ahead, Morgan. Uh, we're talking about acquisition, and I want to um, ask you about um, supply chain resilience. And, you know, right now there are a lot of questions about where solar panels come from and whether we should be building electric vehicles in the United States. And these are topics that are uh, of interest to civilians. Um, but, you know, the Army wields a big purse, and I'm sure that... Uh, there will be some sort of market making happening as a result of these commitments. Um, but I also wonder if there'll be some challenges associated with procuring some of these materials. Um, the other thing that I wanted to sort of raise as we talk about acquisition is scope three emissions and the idea that we should be thinking about sort of the carbon footprint of uh, these resources we're acquiring, not just um, the resources that we utilize for our own operations or your own operations. So that was probably going to be the two hardest questions yeah, on the field today. Yeah, that's great. I'm um, glad I got to them. <laughs> uh, yes, the, the sourcing of the materials is absolutely an issue, and we are well aware of that. Um, uh, at the higher DOD level, they are, that's really where they're looking at it and working with the Biden administration uh, and how we actually onsource, onshore uh, more of these materials. That's a much bigger question than me. Um, I do know that, yes, it is impacting us. Um, our orders for electric vehicles, for instance, just the non-tactical vehicles, the cars that we drive on the bases every day. Uh, the Army put in an order in 2022 for 2,500 um, electric vehicles. Manufacturers came back and said, no, uh, we can give you 1,100. Uh, so we're facing those same issues that everybody else is facing. Um, we will, you know, like I said, at the higher DOD level, they were looking at this, working with the administration on how to do that. Um, and they'll apply the brain power and the resources um, to help make that happen, working with private industry, obviously, because this, is, this isn't a DOD problem, this is a national problem. DOD is not going to solve it. We'll help with what resources we can and the brain power we can, uh, but industry is going to have to really solve this one. Sharon, do you have anything to add on that? Nope. I do. I mean, I think that there's been some recognition now for a while that of supply chain issues, and a lot of it was more about security of supply chain. And, you know, where's that semiconductor coming from and can you trust it? And sort of the idea of trusted foundries. But COVID really shook that up and, and I think shone a bright light on the fact that we had much more vulnerable supply chain than we knew. And I think the administration deserves a lot of credit for recognizing that that's a question you can only answer by bringing lots of different government tools to the table and, and working across the board with private sector and with foreign partners. So things like the Defense Production Act, um, Title III, which the, the administration is using to try to make sure we're catalyzing key industries, again, whether it's semiconductors or critical minerals or across a, a whole range of industries. 
and, and Congress has been a good partner in that too, in being, taking a serious look at how we fix these problems. So I, you know, that wake up call was gonna come sooner or later um, and, and here it is. So I do think that we're seeing some very good serious work on how we fix that problem. And we can't fix it alone. We know we need to work with partners and allies too. Sure. So. Uh, the last topic I wanted to touch on for LOE3 is this idea of contingency basing and what does, uh, what do some of these new technologies do to enhance or challenge um, initiatives in this area? Uh, so contingency basing is a topic near and dear to my heart and I know to Sharon's as well uh, from our work together uh, a decade ago in the Pentagon. Um, contingency bases, they're basically the outposts that we set up um, when we're you know, steer territories for, you know, small platoon of company size, you know, for anywhere from 10 to 20 people to a few hundred people. Uh, and what, how we do that, basically, everything is powered on that contingency base by diesel generators. Um, so that, again, that's more fuel that we have to move through uh, the battlefield to get to there. So what we're looking at doing, uh, and we're working with the acquisition people and with the contingency basing people, uh, to set out a new policy. Because uh, what happens is um, an infantry captain gets told, hey, we need a base here, go set it up. Infantry captain has no idea how to set up a small city, basically, nor should he or she. Uh, that's not what they're trained for, uh, but they've got to do it, so they set up their structures and they plug in generators to every single tent because you need electricity for your communications, for your cooking, for your heating, for your cooling, all of that. Um, what we need to do is actually change the paradigm a little bit so that when this captain goes out and orders and has to set up a contingency base, he or she can just say, hey, I need a base here, and the supply lines, the logistical support system actually just gives, it, gives them what they need. Um, and what we're doing is um, for the, the tents, rather than just uh, tents to put up, it's actually high efficient shelters uh, to make them more energy efficient to reduce the need. Um, the generators that do go, they have to be the most efficient generators. And we've, I mean, we have tens of thousands of generators in our inventory, and we're slowly replacing them over the last decade with highly efficient generators that can also be hooked up to a microgrid for smart generation. Speaking of which, all of the generators, they need to be hooked up to a microgrid, because what will happen is you'll have a dozen generators out there um, powering a dozen different structures, and they're all running you know, at 10 or 20 or 30% of their efficiency, <coughs> not a good use of fuel. By hooking them up to a microgrid, you can run, instead of 12 generators at 30% at, uh, efficiency, they were running two generators at 100%, and that'll uh, balance the load. Also, battery storage. We need to hook up battery storage. That needs to be automatic. That comes with the generator, again, to increase the fuel efficiency. And we're also looking at portable and renewable generation. Um, there are solar panels that can be folded down and put into a container, brought out to the battlefield, and depending on the geography of where you are, you, know, you can unfold them, and that way, again, less fuel. Um, if we can actually cut the fuel use, again, if we can cut the fuel use by half, that's half of the fuel convoys that have to go out. That's half the time the soldiers have to go outside the wire to protect these fuel convoys. I challenge you to find me a soldier that won't be thrilled if, he, if they're told that they don't have to go outside the, uh, the wire to guard these fuel convoys quite as often. So we're really working to standardize all of that. It's funny, you know, I think our temptation is always, you know, nobody wants to be at war, and as soon as the war is over to be like, oh, thank God. We'll never do that again, right? So Vietnam will never do that again, and the Cold War will never do that again. And now Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, which were, were terrible wars, we're done. We'll never do that again. And so the temptation is always to say, well, we don't need contingency bases because we're never going to do that again. But we're sending contingency bases to Poland right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as they say, the enemy gets a vote. And the question is, this time will we have a better capability? Because what we sent our men and women forward in to Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, I, I give the, the equippers, the programs, and the logisticians a lot of credit for the work they did to help those deployments and to create a lot of workarounds. But the institutional army and the institutional military shouldn't have had them in that, in that shape in the first place. We should have had better equipment for them to deploy with um, after 9-11, and we didn't. So, you know, I think it's, it, it, Paul and his colleagues are gonna work really hard to make sure that this equipment is the best it could possibly be, and that we deploy with a small resource footprint because it makes us a better military 
And the question is, will the Army prioritize and support that in a time when they don't think we're going to be deployed again? And of course, like I said, the, you know, the handwriting's already on the wall. We've, we're already sending people forward that weren't there you know, a year ago. And it's actually not just on foreign battlefields. It's actually here at home. That's oh, what yeah. I was thinking. It that's makes me think point. if you yeah. could have this technology and send it to Florida after Ian. Yeah, that's it, a great exactly. point. Exactly. The military yeah. deploys to support civil authorities in response to disasters. So if we set up a base camp in Florida um, for either to shelter the refugees whose homes were destroyed or for the emergency management workers, for the FEMA workers, for the volunteers, uh, for the Army forces that are going to go in and help with the recovery efforts, um, we don't want to be adding to the fuel convoys that have to go down there. You know, the roads need to be open for food and medicine and water, not for fuel to power our base camps. So if we, if we can actually you know, have a camp that's you know, minimal amount of fuel required, that helps the general public here too. Very good. Um, we're running low on time, so I want to pivot to LOE3, which is about uh, Army training. And so uh, one of the topics there is about encouraging sort of army forces to be more mindful of their individual uh, footprint and trying to lower emissions that way. Another one that I think is particularly important is uh, sharing of lessons learned on a biennial basis. Um, I wondered if you could give us a preview of what some of the training and lessons learned sort of formats might look like. Sure, so this really, it's about educating the force. Uh, it's about educating the force on the impact that climate has on our operations and the impact our operations have on the climate. Um, so we're looking, we're working with uh, Training and Doctrine Command, how do we put this into, uh, you know, start educating soldiers in boot camp and through their professional education throughout their career. Uh, one thing that I'm actually really thrilled that we're, that we just announced this week is a new partnership with West Point, uh, where all of our future officers, well not all of our future, a good chunk of our future officers are being trained. Um, we have, um, agreed with West Point and we're supplying some funding for this. Um, West Point is going to actually form uh, the sustainable, uh, S sustainable Infrastructure Resilience and Climate Consortium. Wow. Um, CERC, I always forget what that stands for, but that's what it is. Um, so they're gonna hire, they're gonna get a couple new professors up there. They're gonna actually put uh, into the academic program uh, sustainability, resilience, and climate impacts. Uh, there's going to be a new class offered next fall for the cadets to take uh, that deals with all of these, deals, deals with sustainable building, deals with resist, uh, resilience, uh, and deals with the effects of climate change. Uh, there's going to be a speaker series, and we're going to continue to um, work with them on research projects for both the cadets and the faculty uh, that not just for the education of the cadets and the faculty, but also that to impact the Army. We're giving them real-world problems that we have to figure out uh, and both cadets and faculty are going to uh, be working on that. Uh, so we really, you know, the Army is leading DOD in addressing the climate issue. Um, and we're actually, on the, I believe, on the front edge of the federal government. Uh, West Point is now, as a federal educational institute, also going to be a leading institute uh, addressing climate change and educating uh, our future leaders. And um, what do you think, Sharon, about the opportunity for the Army to sort of share lessons learned uh, either across military branches or among allies and, um, and partners in, in private industry? I, I think it'll be really important. I mean, the Army, obviously, as a, as a culturally important institution in the United States that has a high approval rating as an institution that has presence in a lot of places um, and as a public good that's, that's you know, critical to our security as a, as a country, the Army, you know, has a, a, the opportunity to make a big difference. So it, making it clear that this is something that they're doing for their own ends and that they're educating their force in that, I think will make a big difference. And I also wanted to pivot back to the question that we, we ducked, which wasn't on purpose, but about scope three emissions. Scope three emissions. In the supply chain. The Office of the Secretary of Defense is about to put out a, a request for proposals for a a big sustainability and climate as a service. Um, at least that's that's what they've said is coming. You know, any time now. Yeah, we'll we'll look out for that for sure. And the accounting for emissions throughout the supply chain is going to be part of that, and that will include, you know, that that will be a matter of getting it into contracts and in the acquisition process, so that the companies that do business with the Department of Defense, it will be part of their business. That's how I anticipate they'll go. Then. Um, along those lines, so I actually had a conversation with uh, the leadership of the Corps of Engineers um, just last week talking about how do we actually, you know, account for embodied carbon content in our construction materials um, and sustainable materials. 
And one of the things that always comes up is the cost. Um, is this more expensive? Uh, and on the front end, yes, it probably it is. Um, but what we need to look at, it's no secret that we have some problems with some of our barracks um, that our soldiers are living in. So what we need to look at is if we build with sustainable materials, with more efficient energy systems, with better insulation on our windows, uh, in the long run, over the course of a couple decades that that building will be standing, does that actually protect the soldiers better from mold and other environmental issues that they're going to be facing? So, yeah, maybe it's a little bit more of a cost um, increase on the front end, but over the course of the life cycle, if it provides a better quality of life for our soldiers, that's an investment that's worth making. Very good. I think we've touched on a lot of the important aspects of the plan. I want to pause for just a moment and invite anyone in the audience who might have a question uh, to take the mic. And if I don't see anyone jump up in a second or two. Uh, oh, there we go. There's some enthusiasm. So uh, we can um, wrap up. But I guess we'll take a couple questions. Is it on? Can yeah. you hear me? Yep. Hey, good morning, Paul, Sharon, uh, panelists. My name is Brant Daly. I'm from General Motors Defense. And we've been anxiously awaiting this day, as many of us in industry have been working hard uh, in this area, and this is a springboard to go forward. My, my question for you all is the aspect of how will you or how do you see the leveraging of commercialization to the accelerating the capabilities that we're discussing today, and how can we find greater synergies for the total Army, as well as the synergies with our sister force as we go forward with installate each of the three lines of effort. Thank you. Um, well, first, thanks for being here. Um, GM Defense is a great partner for the Army and all, for all of DOD, and I know that our leadership has been out uh, to Detroit to see uh, your setup and see your vehicles, and I, unfortunately, was not able to make the trip. Uh, couldn't justify all of us going, uh, but I, <laughs> I heard great stories, uh, and I am anxious uh, to do more. Um, really, it's, the government's not going to solve this problem. We're going to do a lot, and we're going to help with it. Um, we're going to help it find the solutions. But private industry is what's going to drive the solutions, just like throughout our history. Um, it's the private sector that is the innovation and a lot of the, re, uh, the resources to actually make this um, happen. Um, and I know that both uh, GM Defense and a whole bunch of other uh, companies out there, they're advancing. You know, when we started talking about hybrid tactical vehicles, uh, you know, and, and the debate inside the Pentagon was, well, can we really do this? And as we built the strategy, I kept getting pushed back, and you know, I wanted to advance the timelines and go bigger and everything. But the acquisition people was like, well, this is realistic. That's what we can do. And then we go and we talk to some of the private industries, like, yeah, well, we've already got that. Um, so again, now we just need to incorporate it into our vehicles, um, which we're looking forward to doing. We're looking forward to increased partnership uh, with you and with the rest of industry, because uh, that's how we're going to get this done. So absolutely, uh, we want to find every opportunity to expand the partnerships um, and work together to define the problem and then solve it. I think there's two distinctions there, right? There's the non-tactical vehicles or passenger and light trucks, where it's, it's a question of this is a, a business and a large business that's trying to buy things for its business using its scale um, for a variety of reasons, including it's, it's better operations, it lowers your emissions, it's better for your relationships with the communities around you, which for, for any large entity is going to be important, but for particularly one that recruits from the general population. So, you know, that's, that's one thing, and that's a volume challenge. Um, and that, I think, will really help with commercialization. Um, the demand for those assets is growing anyway, but that's one kind of challenge. You know, on the tactical side, of course, you know, these vehicles are built for special purpose, and they don't necessarily translate over into the, the, the public use, although it's in the Army's interest to be able to benefit from commercial innovation and not have to have everything be so bespoke. At the same time, in solving your problems for what your tactical vehicles need to do, there may be some innovation there that's novel um, that could uh, come back to the, private, the public use and the private sector. So I think working with a company like GM is in your interest because they cross both uh, Absolutely, both especially uses. with the heavier vehicles. As, yeah. as you're figuring out you know, the trucks you know, for industry and buses and whatnot, we're going to have the same problem with charging. You know, how, what, what's the effect on the grid of charging these heavier vehicles? Uh, and the technology that goes into the vehicles themselves. And I think all, all the services should be looking that, at that too and how to you know, 
win-win, basically, right. on this. Absolutely. I want to get in. Uh, let's see, two more questions here. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Chandler Myers. I am an analyst at Palace Advisors um, here in D.C. Uh, so my first question is to both of you, and then I do have a separate question just for you, Paul. Um, so uh, I'll start with um, Paul um, for this question. So you talked about partnering with West Point. Um, is, was there any discussion for, or, you know, with the Army partnering with other schools, sustainability schools in particular, because that's something that has occurred very recently. I mean, uh, I think two weeks ago, Stanford stood up their sustainability school. Um, and so is there any uh, discussions with the Army, particularly partnering with sustainability schools to encourage and get some of that talent uh, into the, de into the department. Uh, and then my question for both of you um, is, what climate change scenarios is the Army using to kind of force the output um, of the climate strategy and the implementation plan? Thank you. I'll take, uh, so for the education side, uh, we've had some internal discussions about how we're gonna tap into universities. This is how we tap into private industry. Um, I have not had any direct conversations with any universities beyond West Point. Um, I, I would be thrilled to have those conversations. I just haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and now that we've got the implementation plan done, and what I've told my team is, you know, we're at the inflection point now. Is, you know, we spent the first year writing the strategy, getting the implementation plan done. Now we've got to do it. Uh, so now we've been doing a lot over the last year, but now we're really going to kick it into high gear. So I would love to actually explore whether it's Stanford or any other university. Um, absolutely find partnerships because right, there's talent everywhere. I know a lot of people in the Pentagon like to think we're the smartest people in the country, um, but there's an awful lot of talent in this country that we have to tap into because, like I said, this isn't a DOD problem. This is a national problem. We need to take advantage of all of the national talents. Um, so absolutely, and whether it's through um, you know, a partnership with West Point and another college, I think that'd be a great way to look at, uh, to, for that route, um, but uh, we'll absolutely look uh, across the board on that. And there are a number of um, investment programs that are, that are um, enterprise-wide for the Department of Defense, like the, I mean, they're acronyms, so um, to, to figure out what they actually stand for is always a challenge, but CERTIP, <laughs> the uh, Strategic Energy Research and Development Program, I think, um, ESTCP, the Operational right. Energy Capability Improvement Fund, REPI, there's a whole like alphabet soup of programs, um, some of which do have partnerships with universities. Right, and, and we're actually Army working have with a Georgia Tech, there. Um, yeah, down, yeah uh, down at Fort Benning uh, right. for the land use. Um, so yeah, absolutely we want to encourage more of those partnerships. But the more direct partnership, it's a good question. And, you know, as for scenarios, would you like me to? Dive uh, in. <laughs> So that is an excellent question, and, and because, of course, planning scenarios drive a lot of, you know, if you think about how do we, at the end of it, do we get this Army campaign and this Army platform, you know, there's this huge train of planning and strategy and requirements that generates all of that, and planning scenarios are a big piece of it back in the early, you know, which I assume is part of the reason you asked that question. Because if this isn't in that planning scenario process, then climate change really won't be in the end product either. So uh, across the department um, in October 2021, there was a requirement to begin, um, the Secretary of Defense uh, laid out a requirement to begin incorporating climate change into planning scenarios. And there's now a number of efforts to figure out how to do that, including I think pretty much all the combatant commands now have some war gaming uh, going on where they're using climate scenarios. But you know, one of the things that's really interesting about that is there's definitely a knowledge gap between the scientific climate scenarios that drive, say, the IPCC, the UN's body, um, and, and that an organization like the Army, the kind of information they need to know in order to plan, like to actually say, what do, where do we need to put people? Where do we need to put things? What do we need to build? There's a, there's a knowledge gap in there, an analytical gap between the scientific models and what an end user needs. So the, the department's gonna have to be providing a demand signal de facto in order to get those scenarios. So it's a great question. And two of the, I'll just jump in with two other scenarios. Uh, one of which really isn't in, uh, have to do with climate directly, but it's the contested logistics one. 
um, and we're working with the joint staff and the other services to actually put contested logistics into our wargaming. Um, one of the problems that we're facing, our logisticians, they are the best. They are the best in the world and they always have been. They've always been able to get the fuel, the ammunition, the equipment, whatever is needed to the battlefield. We never have to worry about it. Um, we need to rethink that. Um, in a world with a contested logistics line, uh, the fuel is not always going to be able to get there. So what we need to be able to demonstrate is what happens when that fuel doesn't get there. Because combatant commanders, battlefield commanders, they've never really had to face that scenario. So we need to show them that this is a real scenario and what the real impact is, and that's where that will help drive the fuel efficiency, the fuel reductions that we need in our tactical vehicles. And the other really quick, uh, the other one really quick is just a contested homeland. Again, we've never had a fight in a contested homeland, but what happens, pick your adversary, there's a cyber attack at the beginning of the, that conflict and the grid goes down. And I'm not talking for a couple hours or days, I'm talking for months. How are we going to operate? How are the forces going to get where they need to go? It's not gonna be a smooth flow that it's always been. You need electricity on your bases, you need resilient installations. And again, that, so that will all feed into the, it's really, it's changing the mindset, um, as Sharon said, and that's what we need to do. And by injecting these new scenarios that the military has never had to face before, that's how we're gonna do it. And I'm sure the Russia's war in Ukraine has put a fine point on things because they've had to deal with a lot of contested logistics. Absolutely. So, we've, all, you know, we've all seen the tanks sitting for a variety without of fuel along the road. Yeah. Um, so you've got, to, you've got to get fuel. The less fuel you have to move, the better you are. All right. Well, I think that's a terrific note to end on with uh, climate considerations. We're running a little bit over. So oh, oh. Um, we're going to thank you for your... Can we do one last quick one? Okay, we'll do one last quick one. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank you, Morgan. Team. You've done a great job facilitating excellent discussion. Appreciate that. Andrew Morton Schneider Electric. Um, two questions. I'll start with one for both of you. And if we don't have time for the second one, I, I'll grab Mr. Farnan afterwards. But um, what do you... in in there's a lot of challenges you're trying to address, obviously. What do you think is the most complex challenge? Question to both of you, and then Mr. Farnan for you. What are you most proud of in this plan? Thank you. I'm gonna take the second one first. Um, really what I'm most proud of is the way the Army came together. Um, I came on board a year ago, and climate change isn't something that the military would naturally embrace. Um, I was extremely pleased with how the Army embraced this. Um, and I mean every facet of the Army, not just a bunch of policy wonks in the Pentagon, but we talked to every single major command in the Army uh, and supporting commands below that. Everybody was fully on board supporting, sending a great ideas, working with us to hammer out details. Um, you know, the good idea ferry in the Pentagon says, oh, we can just do this. And then when it gets to the ground, the soldiers just laugh, it's like, yeah, that's not possible. So we actually worked with people on the ground. Hey, this is what we want to do. Tell us how we can actually make that happen. Um, so the way the entire Army embraced this plan, uh, that's what thrills me the most, to be perfectly honest. I forget what the first Complexity. question was. Complexity. I mean, I think <laughs> that is, I mean, writ large, that's what we're all struggling with right now, right? Is that we've got all of these different trends and drivers coming together at once, whether it's you know, Russia's war in Ukraine and climate change, biodiversity loss, political challenges at home, uh, the potential of a global recession, and, you know, the increasing sophistication of, of the technology, certainly in your world, uh, industrial control systems, cyber, all of this, all AI, all of this is converging, these convergent trends. And the thing is, we're not set up to govern that way. We govern an issue at a time, and then we have working groups that help go across that. So how do we govern in that world where all of these very complicated trends are crashing into each other and we, we must respond, we have to anticipate, we have to respond. It's really hard, it's a really difficult governance challenge. So that's, you know, the end note I would say is that's for me is, that's one of the reasons I really admire what you've done with this strategy because you're, you're attempting to govern complexity in a way that makes sense for this institution and benefits it, benefits it. and I think you did an, a really admirable job of making a clear case of why and how and what and how much so. <laughs> uh, and, and I would certainly echo everything Sharon said, but I would also add um, the technological advances that are necessary. Um, we're basically 
and we face this across the broader army uh, and across the military, really. You know, you're, we're building a force to operate in the future that still has to operate in the present. So a lot of these goals that we're not going to achieve until 2030 or 2040 or beyond, and we have to set the groundwork for now, so we've got to look at you know, the self-sustained, carbon-free generation on the base. But the technology is not there today to give us 100% resilience. So we still need these fossil fuels. So how do you balance the investments and in making sure that our installations are resilient today when we need them to be, but still moving toward this future? It's a great hanging question. Thank you so much for joining us. Paul, Sharon, our virtual audience, it's been a lovely conversation. Congratulations on your implementation plan. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan.